and uh, it's good to be with you guys. Are you having a good time at Wanderlust? Yeah? It's a wonderful opportunity, uh, these kinds of festivals, to, um, you know, to kind of let go a little bit of having to be somebody all the time and uh, just feel free and, uh, and alive. And uh, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about that. I thought I'd talk a little bit about the, um, the pressures of always having to be somebody. We already are somebody, of course. We're born somebody. We're born as a unique individual, snowflake self-individual, you know, special. Everyone's born special with their own like DNA and their own genetic predispositions and their own personality. And then as, uh, as life goes on and, you know, you have your own set of experiences, you get more and more individualized, right? And, uh, and, and so there's, uh, and it's important, I think, to have a good, healthy sense of uh, esteem, self-esteem about your specialness, about your individual, you know, somebody self, unique self. But, uh, you know, in our culture, in the culture that we live in, we're encouraged all the time to be more of a somebody, to be specialer, to be, uh, and, and maybe like with the hopes that someday we'll be the specialist. And uh, so uh, the, the times that we live in are amazing times, you know, they're, they're unprecedented in the, um, in the technology that we enjoy, in the ability to communicate with one another instantaneously around the world and so forth, with the um, possibility that, te that modern technology has brought to bring us closer together than we ever have been, you know, globally. But the, uh, the downside of the culture that we live in is that it is, tends to be very self-centered in its orientation. The, the, in 1979, a, a social scientist named Christopher Lash wrote a book called The Culture of Narcissism in which he, uh, you know, way back then, announced that we had moved into a phase in, in you know, modern cultures like here in America, where uh, there, for the first time, really, in, in history, there has been a cultural validation of self-centeredness, of just thinking about me all the time. And we see this in all kinds of dimensions. I mean, for one, and it's a very big dimension, uh, the whole economy is based on me on self-centeredness, you know. In case you were wondering what the economy was, it's consumerism. And it's one worldwide. There used to be at least two options. There used to be communism and consumerism, capitalism. But uh, of course, communism is pretty much dead. The only communist country left is China, and they're as consumerist as anyone else. So consumerism is a worldwide phenomenon, and it, it has as its heart and soul to keep us always dissatisfied, always wanting to more, you know, more, more goods, more services, more consumer goods, more experiences, you know, more, more, more. And, uh, and never be satisfied with who we are and the life that we have. So beginning with the economy and then, you know, and all kinds of other dimensions too. The, the orientation is we, we are encouraged, culturally encouraged to think about ourselves all the time. And to think about what we want, what we need as individuals, right? What, you know, how am I doing? Am I happy? Am I sad? Am I fulfilled? You know, all of this kind of thing. Then with the social networks, who here isn't on Facebook? All right. For those people who aren't on Facebook, the whole of Facebook is about me. First of all, you put your own page up, number one, you know, with your picture and all like that. And then, and then you collect friends on Facebook, right? Many of whom you never heard of before. And then, uh, you know, m much of what goes on in Facebook is, you know, things like this. You know, you take a photograph of what you had for dinner, and then you upload it to Facebook, and then you wait for the thumbs up. You know, your friends give you thumbs up. You know, in other words, affirmation, self-affirmation. There's no thumbs down on Facebook. That's not accidental. No one has the option to say, your dinner sucks. <laughs> it's always like, oh, awesome dinner, dude, you know. And then if you don't get enough thumbs up with the dinner, then you take it to the next level. You put a picture of your cat up. And then you, you know, and then you wait for the thumbs up again, and it's like, you know, this is my cat. How, you know, don't you like my cat? <laughs> Look at my cat, it's playing in the, pla in, the, in the paper bag again. Look, you know. Those of you who are on, on Facebook, and it's most of you, know that if you took all the cat photos down from Facebook, there'd be very little left, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all about me, you know, and the affirmations. 
you know, the thumbs up. Uh, and, and that's very typical of the society that we live in. The television shows that we watch are, you know, tend to be about ordinary people who become suddenly famous. Hmm? The talent shows and, you know, the America, you sure can dance and all of those reality shows. And, you know, they're all about ordinary people like you and me who suddenly are famous. You know, who, or, or YouTube, you know, much of YouTube is about people posting up on YouTube little clips in the hopes that it'll go viral. Like you'll be the next Justin Bieber. You all know how Justin Bieber got his start, right? His mom put a, 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 a little video up of him playing the drums when he was, I don't know, six, seven, eight years old or something like that. And he's awesome, of course, playing the drums. And, and he became Justin Bieber overnight. So there's all kinds of forces at work in the present culture that we live in that encourage us to think about being specialer all the time. And it's a heavy burden. It's, it's a burden to have to be somebody all the time. So uh, we have the opportunity regularly in life to have the experience of feeling what it's like to not have to be somebody, to let go, to put the burden down for a while. And so I thought I'd talk about a number of these, because these are, very, um, these are special experiences that are pointing us to a very interesting truth. And it's a truth that the spiritual traditions have known for a long, long time. The, the you know, authentic spiritual traditions of humankind have never said, not a single one, have said that you will feel better, happier, more fulfilled, and so forth by thinking about yourself more than you already do. No one has ever said that, you see. So we actually do have times when we can stop thinking about ourselves. You know, when that little voice inside, everyone got one of those, or is it just me? <laughs> if it's just me, I'm in trouble. Everyone got one? That little voice inside, that self-consciousness, it's when that voice shuts up, actually, that we are happiest. And I'll give you a couple of very ordinary, you know, experiences of, of when that happens. When you get absorbed into a good book, or into a good movie, you know? Where are you then? As you're reading the book, if you're reading a book self-consciously, you're not enjoying the book, you see? It's when you stop, the, when the somebody self little voice inside shuts up. It's, it's when you get absorbed in the book, and absorbed in the storyline of the book. And, you know, minutes and sometimes hours go by, and, you know, just like that, right? Same with a good movie. That's what makes a good movie a good movie, is that you vacate yourself for an hour and a half or two hours and just get absorbed into the narrative, right? And if that doesn't happen, that's not a good movie. If, you know, you're sitting there with, you know, being your own personal film critic with that little voice going on, you know, oh, that, that performance is not so good, or, you know, I could have written a better screenplay. <laughs> then that's not a good movie. You're not enjoying it, you see? So where are you then? Where, what happens to the somebody self when you get absorbed into a book or a movie? You know, it's gone. And, it, and you're happy. <laughs> Here's another example. It's when, when we're absorbed in our hobbies. You know, everyone got hobbies. Probably all you guys got yoga as your hobby, if, if not your profession. But when you get absorbed in whatever it is that you love to do as a hobby, skiing, or I used to do a lot of surfing, and... Uh, and, and the whole attraction of the hobby is that you can get absorbed in the activity and stop thinking about yourself for a while, you see? And that's an even more better example than, you know, books and, and, uh, and movies, let alone television. Because especially movies and television are all very passive, right? You lose yourself in a passive way. But when you're engaged in your hobby, for example, that's a very active thing, you know? You have to be active, you have to, be, you have to sort of be present, but not be present. I call this state mindful unselfconsciousness. You have to be mindful, okay? You know, if you're skiing, if you're surfing, if you're rollerblading, whatever your hobby is, you know, you have to be mindful or else you're not gonna be able to do it, right? It's part of the attraction of the hobby that it's a bit challenging. So mindfulness has to be there, but unselfconsciously, you see? Not thinking about yourself and am I enjoying my hobby? Or what am I going to get out of my hobby? Am I, you know, am I going to uh, you know, somehow like climb the social ladder 
you know, through my, through my hobby. You see, it's pure enjoyment. So we have these experiences of what it feels like to lose ourselves and to lose ourselves in action, which is kind of a very interesting thing, not just passively, but, but in activity. We can lose ourselves in yoga. You know, if, if we're in the flow doing, you know, an asana sequence or something like that. You know, you, especially for an experienced yogi, you know, you, you don't have to think about every pose. You know what I mean? You just flow through it. And, uh, and, and that's, uh, th that's when you're having the best time doing yoga, is when you're not there. So we have these experiences in all kinds of ways. Uh, I understand that there is music at this festival, is that right? Uh, I, I was at the Wanderlust in Vermont two years ago, and we went to hear Ziggy Marley, uh, who was playing that. And thousands of people, you know, just like blissed out you know, dancing to the reggae, you know, in complete ecstasy. And uh, where are you then when, you know, you have this experience of losing yourself on the dance floor? And uh, that's, not, um, that's not calculated activity. That's not what's in it for me activity, which is most of our activity. When we're, when we're somebody, it's always like, well, is this going to pay off for me? Is this going to, you know... Is this going to be beneficial in some way for me personally? But when we can lose ourselves in the dance, you know, there's no ulterior motive to it. It's not like, what are you going to get out of it? It's, it's fun for its own sake, isn't it? And, and because we can lose the, you know, the sense of calculation, the sense of like, you know, what am I going to get out of it? We can drop ourselves. We can drop our somebody selves and be absorbed in the dance. This is pure dance, by the way. You know, not all dance is pure. America, you sure can't dance. You sure can't dance. That show, you know, is there a show like that? Or did I just make it up? America, you sure can't dance is not about, you know, <laughs> pure dance, right? It's not about pure dance. It's about, uh, it's a contest, you know? It's who's a better dancer? Who's going to be specialer as a dancer? And uh, similarly, if you're, you know, if you're on the dance floor tonight and, uh, you know, trying to impress the, you know, the cute guy or the cute girl, you know, with your awesome moves, <laughs> so that's not pure dance either. That's, that's about the somebody self again. You haven't lost yourself in the movement. You haven't been absorbed in, in the dance. So these are very interesting experiences that we have of, of, of when we can stop the self-consciousness, when we can stop feeling like we always have to be specialer, that we can then really enjoy what it is that we're doing by, by being nobody. So the book I wrote is called Be Nobody. You know, some, sometimes people hear that title and they go, what do you mean, Be Nobody? I, I already feel like a big fat zero. I want to be somebody. I want to, and, and furthermore, I want to be a very special somebody. Well, look, you're already special somebody. You know, the problem is, is that we're never content with our special somebodyness, and always feel like we need to be specialer, more of a somebody. And so the the be nobody thing should, you know, if, if you understand what I'm talking about, it, it is in those moments when we are nobody that we're happiest that we're most integrated with life, that we're most aware, that we're most satisfied, that we're most content, that we're most uh, you know, able to drop the mediation between ourselves and the life that we're leading. You know, that little somebody self is mediating between you and living. It's like a sports announcer or something like that, a little sports announcer in there announcing the game, you know, talking the play-by-play -play of the game, instead of actually living the game, you know, involved in the game. So it's when that voice shuts up that we actually become integrated with life. And uh, since we're at a yoga conference, yoga music conference, this is the goal of yoga. Samadhi means integration in Sanskrit. That's what it means. And, you know, there's a lot of different understandings of, you know, what, what samadhi means. But seems to me that one of the things it means is integrating with life as you're living it fully instead of talking about living or criticizing it 
or you know, thinking it's going to get better some other time, or what am I going to get out of this deal? All the somebody self chatter up there. And truly living life moment by moment fully, integrated with life. And in order to do that, the somebody self's got to get out of the way, you know? There's another yoga. There's another kind of yoga. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's called karma yoga. This is the yoga that's taught in probably the second most important yoga text from India. The first one's Yoga Sutra, obviously. But the second, e easily the second, is the Bhagavad Gita. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, who is, you know, everyone knows Krishna, right? Hare Krishna, same Krishna, you know, also known as God. Uh, <laughs> Krishna uh, talks to his student, Arjuna. And Arjuna's in a big mess. Arjuna can't figure out how to, how to live, really. You know, how to, how to proceed with life. How to live a good life, you could say. And uh, among the things that Krishna teaches him, um, among the most important uh, techniques that Krishna teaches Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita is called karma yoga. Yoga, the discipline of action. And so this is a religious technique for getting into the zone, for getting into the flow, just like you do when you're dancing or when you're you know, in the zone in a yoga flow or, or when you're in involved in a good book or a good movie or a good hobby. Krishna teaches 2,000 years ago a way to discipline ourselves to do that in every action, in every activity that we are engaged in in life. Not just the sort of peak experiences of you know, being at a rave or, or being on drugs, by the way. One of the, one of the attractions, obviously, of being on drugs is that you can lose yourself, right? But then, you know, you come back, <laughs> probably with a headache or you know, something. So Krishna teaches karma yoga. What is karma yoga? Do your duty, he says, you know, which, which means do what there is for you to do in life. Do what there is that you are called upon to do. You know, if you have a job, do your job. If you have a family, raise a family. You know, if you have responsibilities, take care of your responsibilities. Do whatever it is that you have to do in life. But do it with yoga, with discipline. And then Arjuna says, well, what does that mean? And Krishna says, basically, do your duty, do whatever it is that you're doing, without attention to the fruits of action. Without attention, in other words, to what you're going to get out of it personally. And, uh, and, and so what he's really teaching is to do your, do your whatever it is that you're doing in this kind of flow state where the somebody self is sh has shut up because the somebody self is always interested in what, you know, I'm going to get out of it. So if we do any action, you know, re regardless what it is, taking out the garbage, going to work, taking the kids to the soccer game, you know, doing your yoga practice, whatever action that you are doing, if you do it without attention to the fruits, number one, you are concentrated on it fully. Because some large part of your mind in, in ordinary ways of thinking about action is taken up with, you know, what am I going to get out of it? Is this going to work out for me? Am I, or, I wish I didn't have to do this. And I can hardly wait to do something else, you see. Some part of your mind isn't there, isn't fully there in the action. So stopping thinking about the fruits of action, what am I going to get out of it, makes it possible to do action one-pointedly with concentration, fully, fully being there, you see? Because, because the somebody self has shut up. And, and when the somebody self has shut up, then, then we are integrated, we are concentrated. We, just like in the dance, just like in the rave, just like in the hobby, you see? So karma yoga is the discipline of being able to do that throughout life, in every single action. And of course it's a discipline, it's yoga. For those of you who don't know what yoga means, if everyone sort of thinks they know what yoga means, yoga, you know, in the Sanskrit English dictionary, there's page after page after page of what yoga means. But, but there is nothing in those definitions, English definitions of yoga, that has the connotation of easy. It's a discipline, you see? It's, it's a discipline. And so, if we want to live happily, just like when we're happiest, when we lose ourselves in the dance, when we lose ourselves in the flow, if we want to live happily moment to moment, we have to discipline ourselves to be in that moment fully, regardless of what that moment is, you know? Whether the, 
whether we're called upon to do a pleasant thing or an unpleasant thing, whether we're called upon to play or whether we're called upon to work, if we can do our work with the karma yoga attitude, then it becomes play. It becomes action for its own sake, not for what you're going to get out of it, not for the fruit. And that's exactly what we do when we play. We do action for its own sake because it's fun to do. So if you want to live a fun life, practice karma yoga. And that means a practice. That's a practice. And that, that requires that we stay attentive, attentive to what's happening in the here and now. So last thing, you know, because I'm running out of time, I think. Uh, I'd like to pass along a very powerful mantra to you guys, okay? You all know what mantras is, right? A mantra is. Uh, so, so most mantras are in Sanskrit, so I'll, I'll throw in some Sanskrit, and then we'll give you the mantra in English so, so you know what the hell it means. <laughs> this is the mantra that you, that you can use to stay present in the here and now so that you can practice karma yoga, action for its own sake. Say Om. Ah, oh, come on, everyone can say it louder than that. Say Om. Om. It's, it's like, like this, this now. now. And, it, and it is, you know. It's never not like this now. It's like this now. So, so that's a very good mantra to keep you focused on the fact that it always is like this now. And stop spacing out. You know, it's a very good mantra for both good times and bad times. You know, in good times it's like this now, so enjoy it. Because it's not always going to be like this now. You see, that's the thing about the mantra, you've got to keep going with it, because now changes. <laughs> so you can't just like, say it's like this now and then stop, you see. So, so when it's like this now and, it's, uh, you know, and, and th times are good, enjoy them. Because it's not going to be like this now forever. And when it's like this now and it's challenging, well, it's like this now. So what's my best play here, you know? It's not avoiding reality. It's not thinking about, you know, I wish it. The mantra isn't, I wish it weren't like this now. <laughs> or I wish it were different than this now. Or it's like this now and it sucks like this now. See? <laughs> no, no one cares that, that you think it sucks. You see? It's like this now. Whether you like it or not, whether you think it should be like this now or not, you know what? It's like this now. So, so like, it's like, you know, every moment, really, it's like getting a new hand of cards, you know? And the cosmic dealer doesn't care if you don't like the cards. You can't turn the cards back and say, no, I, I want a new hand. Or you can't even turn a couple of them back and say, I like three of them, but not these two. Could I get two, two, two different ones? You know, it's like this now. These are the cards that you have to play. So how to play them, you know, wisely compassionately and fully, living fully in the moment, regardless of what your cards are, you see? Regardless of what the experience is, karma yoga. So practice karma yoga. It's a very difficult thing. It's hard to remember. So that's why I invented that mantra. It's like this now. And that mantra is a very powerful mantra, okay? Just because it isn't in Sanskrit doesn't mean it's not powerful. <laughs> All right, thanks for listening.